All right, welcome back everybody. Um, today we're gonna look at uh, the second lesson on rotational dynamics. We're gonna look at something called rotational inertia, momentum, and kinetic energy. So um, in the previous section, we kind of looked at how kinematics works for rotating um, objects. So we looked at rotational kinematics. And that describes um, like angular velocities, or angular rotation, angular acceleration, and so on. But now we're going to take a look at the dynamics. And so this is going to kind of get to the story behind those accelerations, like the forces, the torques, uh, the momentum, energy, all that kind of stuff. So um, if you imagine for a second, you've got two doors with the same dimensions, and you're going to push them open with the same force. One of the doors is made of balsa wood, and the other is made of black ironwood. Which door opens faster and why? And so I think most people would have a pretty easy understanding that the balsa wood would open more easily or open faster. And the reason for that would simply be, well, it has less mass overall. Um, and if there's less mass, since F net equals MA, then you'll have a greater acceleration. But um, just stop and consider this situation for a moment. Imagine we've got a, a door like this. So we're kind of looking at the top view of the door. You're kind of looking down on top of it. And you come along and you apply some force to this door to open it. Um, it's going to start to pivot around this hinge. So it's going to swing open. Now obviously the more force you apply, the faster it will accelerate open. Um, but it also turns out that as we mentioned, the, the amount of mass of the door is going to affect the acceleration. It shouldn't be a surprise though to remember from the previous unit that also where you apply the force is going to matter. So if you apply the force at the end of the door versus in the middle of the door, that's going to give it a different amount of torque and that's going to give it a different acceleration. But what I want you to consider is it's not just the amount of mass, but it's also where that mass is distributed. And that's one of the things we're going to kind of look at today. So let's think about this example as we go ahead and connect this to Newton's second law. So you'll remember Newton's second law basically said the sum of all forces or the net force is equal to ma. Well, if we're talking about a rotating body, then um, remember we're not going to talk, well, less often we're going to talk about our linear acceleration and instead we're going to talk about angular acceleration. And we learned last day that angular acceleration alpha is equal to your linear acceleration divided by the radius or the um, linear acceleration is alpha times r. If I substitute this in here, I would get an expression that says m r alpha. And so uh, remember that we've also um, recently looked at uh, something called torque. And so if we have forces acting on objects and they start to rotate, we don't actually usually like to talk about the force on the object, we like to talk about the torque. And you might remember that torque is equal to force times distance, where this distance is the distance to the pivot. So for example, in this case, uh, you know that might be the distance that we exert the force. Well, there's another symbol we use for sometimes uh, for distance. Instead of calling it distance, if you imagine that we have, say, um, an, an object, like a ring or a ball or something like this, and this object is starting to rotate, if we exert a force on the outside of that object, well then the distance that we exert that force from the pivot or from the center of mass is actually gonna be the radius of the ring. And so if we kind of think of D and R being the same thing. So if an object is rotating in a circle, the distance to the pivot, we can think of that as being the same as the radius of the object. Now I'm using the term radius here loosely because we might not be talking about, um, we might be talking about regular shapes. For this course, we're gonna focus on things that have regular shapes, spheres and disks and rings. And later on, you'll learn that there are ways to um, analyze things even that don't have some sort of regular radius. Although for right now, we won't have to worry about it too much. So we could then think of our torque as being force times r, or r being that distance to that center of mass. So we can say that torque is equal to f times r, and then we know that f from up here is equal to mr alpha. So we can substitute that down on the bottom and we get mr alpha times r. Which if we put that all together, we get an expression that says torque is equal to mr squared alpha. And we just kind of, um, I'm just collecting the r values in that case. And so what this actually, this looks like, I know this looks like a bit of a mess, 
and it's not going to make a ton of sense right off the bat. But I just want to draw kind of an analogy here to F net equals M A. When we talk about rotating objects, we're not going to talk about force, we're going to talk about torque. So there's like an analogy here I want you to think about between torque and force. Just like we saw that there's an analogy between um, linear acceleration and rotational acceleration. The question then becomes, what the heck is this leftover thing? Like what is this? This mr squared term. Because whatever that is, is going to be kind of like analogous to the mass, where the more mass something has, the harder it is to accelerate. In this case, for a rotating object, the more mr squared an object has, the harder it's going to be to accelerate. Okay? So, um, let's bring this back to Newton's first law. Newton's first law, objects in motion will stay in motion. And so, if we're talking about a rotate, uh, uh, whether it's an object that's rotating or going in a straight line, this is all related to the inertia of the object. So, if you're talking about linear, uh, motion, the bigger the object is, the more it's going to want to keep on going in a straight line. Whereas if we're talking about rotating objects, it's not just about the mass, it's about something called the rotational inertia. And rotational inertia is that mr squared term. So just think about this for a second because it is kind of a tricky concept. If we're talking about rotating an object, how difficult it is to rotate depends on two things. It's no longer just depending on the mass. Yes, the mass matters. That's part of the story. But the other thing that matters is where is that mass located relative to its um, center or relative to its point of rotation. So the further away the mass is from the point of rotation, the more difficult it is to rotate. And it talks about the tendency uh, for objects uh, in moving in a circle to keep moving in a circle. I really should say objects that are rotating. Okay, so if you have this situation or imagine you don't have like um, just a ball on a string like a really simple uh, object, if you have something that's a little bit more complex, um, then you have to use something called the moment of inertia. So if you have several um, objects moving in a circle, then we have to find the total sum the rotational inertias. And the total sum of the rotational inertias of an object is known as the moment of inertia. Okay, so the moment of inertia, which we give the symbol I, is equal to the sum of the rotational inertias, mr squared. So this term here is um, moment of inertia. Now, what uh, if you think about that, the units for that are going to be kilograms times meters squared. Now, let me just kind of highlight what I'm, um, what I'm trying to say there. If you have just a ball on a string, okay, imagine you've got a ball on a string, that sounds familiar, and you're just twirling it around in a circle, that's really straightforward. The, um, the moment of inertia of this object is just going to be mr squared because all of the mass of the object is concentrated out here a distance away from its rotation at a distance r. All the mass is located there and it's a distance r away. But what if you just took a simple, just make a simple change and now think of a solid disk. So imagine that I have a solid disk. As that object rotates, you can imagine that not all of the mass is here on the outer edge of the object. Some of it's here, some of it's here, some of it's here. In fact, some of it's over here and here. So the location of the matter is not going to be just out the outer edge. And that's why we need this idea of moments of inertia. Okay. So if we just connect this back to what we were talking about before, just really quickly, and we look at um, torque, we say the sum of all torques, we know that that's going to equal the sum of all uh, of the rotational inertias, or the moments of inertia, times alpha. Or to put another way, the sum of the torques, or the net torque, is going to equal the moment of inertia times alpha. And again, I just want to draw that parallel back because we're going to kind of see it over and over again that this is just basically the rotational version of the sum of all forces equals ma. You can see the parallels there.
Okay, so I want to just um, digress for a minute here to talk a little bit about rotational um, uh, inertia and moments of inertia because it is kind of a weird conceptual concept. Uh, so let's just do like a little side by side comparison. So imagine here what I've got is I've got a I've got a wheel uh, and it's fixed here to uh, to an axis, so it's it's going to be able to rotate. It's got a radius of two meters, a mass of five kilograms, and I'm going to exert a force of twenty newtons here, right on the outer edge of the wheel. And when I start that rotating, you can see that the torque is just going to be 20 newtons times the 2 meters. So the torque is a 40 newton meter torque that I'm going to apply to that. And then over on the other side here, I've got the exact same situation, same radius, same mass, same force, same everything, except the object is now a disc. So it has the same total mass, but the mass is evenly spread all over, um, all over the disc. When I run these two, we can um, notice that they're going to accelerate at different rates. And so I want you to think about why that is. You can see here the disc is accelerating because of this torque, it's accelerating at four radians per second squared, whereas the ring or the bike wheel is only accelerating at two radians per second squared. Now, why is that? If it's the same torque, why the different acceleration? And the answer is that the moment of inertia for this ring, all of the mass is spread around the outside of that ring. Whereas for the disc, like we talked about before, the mass is evenly spread around the, the inside. So yes, some of the mass is on the very outside. That mass is gonna be hard to accelerate, but some of the mass is right in the center. And that mass doesn't actually need to be accelerated at all because it's not going anywhere. So what about the piece of mass that's halfway along or two thirds or whatever? It gets a little bit complex. So to figure out the exact moment of inertia, you'd have to use a little trick called calculus, which we're not gonna get into today, but what you need to be able to recognize is that different shapes will have these different moments and you should be able to understand why and explain why um, a ring will accelerate more slowly than a disc because of the distribution of the mass. If you want to do another comparison, imagine a solid sphere versus a spherical shell. So a bowling ball versus a basketball where somehow they're the same size and they're the same mass. If I run these two scenarios, we can see not a huge surprise, hopefully, the bowling ball actually had a um, higher acceleration than the basketball. And that's again because of how that mass is distributed. What I want you to notice on top of that though is that both of these had different accelerations than the ring and the uh, and the, the cylinder. And that's because just because of the way the masses are spread around. So if we jump back to the back page of the notes here, we're going to talk a little bit about mass distribution. So um, different masses, uh, sorry, different shapes have different mass distributions. Um, and so as a result, we'll have different moments of inertia. And so you can see from this table over here, there's a whole list of of different um, moments of inertia for different shapes. Now, um, you do not need to memorize these at all, um, but it should, it should be the kind of thing where when you look at it, you're able to maybe explain why, for example, a hoop or a ring has um, a moment of inertia that's mR squared, whereas a solid cylinder has a moment of inertia that's one half mR squared. You can see that the cylinder's easier to rotate, which is why it won the race versus the ring. And you might uh, be, have to be able to explain why, for example, a solid sphere has a rotation, um, a moment of inertia two fifths mR squared, whereas uh, the spherical shell has a moment of inertia of uh, two thirds mR squared. And again, that's why the solid sphere um, won the race versus the shell. Okay, so let's take a look at an example here. A bicycle rim has a diameter of 0.65 meters and a moment of inertia measured about its center of 0.19 kilo, kilogram meters squared. So we've got a, a bike rim and the diameter is 0 0.65 meters. And um, we're looking for the mass of the rim. Now we know that um, this is essentially a ring. Okay, so this is the same shape as a ring or a hoop. So I'm going to use a moment of inertia 
of i equal to m r squared. Now you're going to have to be able to look at the situation and, and decide which, um, you don't have to memorize the individual moments of inertia, but you will have to kind of figure out which best fits that scenario. So uh, if i equals m r squared, then solving for m equals i over r squared. Now i is my moment of inertia, 0 0.19, and r, don't forget that will be radius, distance to the uh, point of rotation. So divide my diameter by half and I get 0 0.3. 325 squared, which gives me a total mass of around 1.8 kilograms. Um, and so, yeah, let's do a couple more examples here. So, find the net torque required for your hip muscles to swing your leg at an angular um, acceleration of 5 radians per second squared if you assume the leg is a solid rod with a mass of 20 kilograms and a length of 0.9 meters. So while your leg is certainly not just a uniform um, rod, if we think about that, we've got our moment of inertia up here. The moment of inertia for a rod around the end is one third uh, ml squared. Okay, so one third ml squared, which is the total length of the rod. Okay, so the sum of all torques we know is going to equal I times alpha which is equal to one third ML squared times alpha, which is one third times the mass, which is 20, uh, the length, which is 0 0.90, and then the acceleration was five radians per second squared. And so the total torque required would be 40.5, or let's call it just 41 Newton meters. Okay, um, I'm going to skip to the next example here, just in the interest of, of time. Um, suppose we've got a, a merry-go-round, um, starts at rest and is accelerated uniformly, completing four rotations in six seconds. Find its angular acceleration. So this goes back to what we learned last day about knowing um, the number of rotations and the time. And so um, four rotations... Uh, multiply that by 2 pi radians for every rotation is going to be right around 25.13 radians. So it, it spins through 25.13 radians. Um, the variables that we talked about last day, final angular velocity, initial angular velocity, uh, angular acceleration, rotational angle, and time I'm going to set these up so I've got 25.13 radians and my time was 6 seconds. And then I know my initial um, angular, ex uh, sorry, angular velocity is 0. So um, solving for angular acceleration, I'll use this formula uh, angle equals initial, or sorry, yeah, initial angular velocity uh, times time plus 1 half times angular acceleration times time squared. This will go to zero. And then solving for angular acceleration, I get two theta over t squared. So two times 25.13 over 6.00 squared. And this gives me an acceleration of 1.396. So call that 1.4 radians per second squared. Okay, so if the merry-go-round is uh, a disc shape with a mass of 115 kilograms and a radius of 1.8 meters, calculate the net torque acting on the merry-go-round. All right, so again, we have to go back to our chart back up at the top here and look for a disc. And so a disc would actually just be, would just be like a really flat cylinder. And so the, uh, the moment of inertia for a disc is going to be one half m r squared. So the sum of all torque is equal to i times alpha, which would equal one half m r squared times alpha. So one half times 115 kilograms times 1.8 squared times 1.396. And the torque ends up being 260 newton meters of torque.
Okay, so um, we're not going to go through full derivations for um, this next section. Uh, we could do it, but it would be, I think it would be a bit onerous in terms of the time. So I'm going to kind of just throw these at you. And I know that it's a lot, but um, we're going to keep on drawing parallels back between linear dynamics and rotational dynamics. So we've done that with acceleration. We've done that with force and torque. Um, what about momentum or impulse or energy? And it turns out those all are in line. So for example, with linear momentum, the symbol is just rho, and we know that rho is equal to m times v, and the units are kilogram meters per second. Well, there is something called angular momentum. And angular momentum, we use the symbol L, and you could draw the parallel. If mass, um, the mass of an object, remember when we talk about rotation, we're not going to talk about mass, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about rotational inertia. So that's going to equal I instead of M, it's going to be I multiplied by instead of V, when we talk about rotation, we talk about uh, angular velocity. So it's going to be um, I times omega. And so don't forget that the units here are kilogram times meters squared, and the units there are radians per second. So the units will actually be kilogram meter squared per second. Um, so we're going to do the same thing here with impulse. And impulse, of course, is related to momentum. So impulse being a change in momentum. And the formula that we saw was a change in momentum is equal to, you can either think of it as m delta v, but I want to think about the version where we say the change in momentum is equal to f net times time. And again, the units are kilogram meters per second. So if we talk about angular impulse, then it's just delta l, the change in um, rotational uh, momentum or angular momentum and then if we think about this version of the formula the formula for uh, angular uh, impulse well when we talk about rotating objects we don't talk about force instead we talk about torque so it will be the torque times the time and again the units are the same kilogram meter squared per second okay last but not least here we're gonna look at um, uh, linear kinetic energy versus rotational. So an object that is that is uh, rotating um, is going to have kinetic energy. It's it, just the same as an object that's moving forwards or backwards. And so when we talk about um, rotational kinetic, sorry, linear kinetic energy, we often use the symbol EK. Whereas for rotational kinetic energy, we might use the symbol ER. And so the formula here, EK equals one half mv squared. When we talk about the formula for um, rotational energy, that's going to equal 1 half times I times omega squared. Where, um, just like before, instead of mass, we're going to use uh, moment of inertia. Instead of velocity, we're going to use angular velocity. Now, the units here are joules, which, of course, are a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Notice that these are the same units. These are also joules because they are kilogram meters squared per second squared. So two quick examples of where um, this can be used. Um, imagine we've got a figure skater uh, that has a moment of inertia of 6.5 kilogram meters squared when her arms are outstretched and 3.8 kilogram meters squared when her arms are pulled in. She is currently, she is initially spinning with an angular velocity of 8.2 radians per second with her arms outstretched and she pulls her arms inward. What happens to her angular velocity. And so this is something you may have seen when figure skaters want to spin really quickly. They start, for example, with their arms or legs outstretched. And as they pull their arms inwards, they start to spin more quickly. You might have experienced the same thing on like a playground with those um, nauseating spinny toys as you sit on it. If you get closer to the center, you spin even faster. Well, just like with linear momentum, angular momentum works the same way. So for example, there is something called the conservation of angular momentum. So for if the initial angular momentum is Li, then it must be equal to the final angular momentum Lf. We learned that angular momentum is I times omega. And so final must equal initial. Solving for our final um, angular momentum, that's going to be 
initial moment of inertia times initial angular velocity divided by the final moment of inertia. 6.5 times 8.2 over 3.8 gives about 14 radians per second. And so we can, we've seen this, it can happen, it'd be quite dramatic, right? The closer you are to the center of rotation, the faster you're going to spin. Now, something to consider though, um, as, as the figure skater spins faster, how does the rotational energy compare, um, the initial rotational energy compare to her final rotational energy? It's certainly really tempting to say, well, it must be the same because it seems like a closed system and so isn't um, energy conserved. When we look at the formula for rotational energy, it's equal to one half I omega squared. The fact that this is squared is gonna have a much more dramatic effect. So because this is squared, um, she's going to end up with more energy than she started it with. So the energy initial is actually less than the energy final because while her moment of inertia decreases, her angular um, velocity increases proportionally and then that number is squared. And so if that seems like she's breaking the law of conservation of energy, just consider for a second that she actually had to do work to pull her arms inwards. And so she's actually causing herself to spin faster. She's adding energy to the system that she's in by just moving her arms back and forth. All right, uh, that's it for our second lesson on rotational dynamics.